Well, good afternoon. I'm uh, Daniel Benjamin. I want to welcome you to this event. Do I have two mics on? Or one? Okay. Uh, and I want to welcome you to this event of the John Sloan Dickey Center. It is uh, my great pleasure that today we will hear from Ambassador Ashok Mukherjee, India's uh, permanent representative to the United Nations since April of 2013. And he will speak to us on India's transformation. Well, it's obviously a subject of profound relevance, and we've all watched as India has taken an ever greater role on the world stage over the last 20 years as its middle class has developed. And all of this has happened in a period in which the landscape of international relations has been redrawn. Power, as is widely agreed, is dramatically more diffused than ever, with India, China, and other players carrying more weight uh, than at any time in history. In India's particular case, uh, these developments have accelerated dramatically with the inauguration a little less than a year ago of Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who shows every sign of being one of the most energetic leaders of his era. Ambassador Mukherjee, and I also want to welcome his wife, Anita, who's here with us, uh, is the perfect person to discuss India's transformation because he's lived much of it and seen it from so many different angles. His current appointment to the United Nations is the capstone of a truly exceptional career. And I say capstone because he tells me he faces mandatory retirement later this year. Um, but I'm fairly certain that India, which has shown that it knows how to retain talent, will uh, figure out something else for him to do uh, when that time comes. Uh, the achievements of this 36-year career uh, speak for themselves. Before coming to New York, he was Special Secretary for Political Issues, essentially the equivalent to one of our undersecretaries in the Ministry of External Affairs in New Delhi. He was uh, Deputy Chief of Mission in Moscow. He was Acting uh, High Commissioner in London, Ambassador in Kazakhstan, and as Consul General for India in what was then Soviet Central Asia, he opened or headed embassies in Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Turkmenistan. Um, he has also been Consul General in Dubai, India's largest uh, consulate, and he was a political officer in Washington. In those postings and in New Delhi, he uh, did a huge array of different tasks. He negotiated the acquisition of advanced military systems. He um, also worked on India's first uh, acquisition of a, its first Caspian Sea oil field. He is uh, an expert on the World Trade Organization, and he led uh, the first ever public-private partnership welfare scheme for the one million Indian workers in the United Arab Emirates. He's worked on policy planning, border management, cyber issues, and counterterrorism, to name just a few. It's in that last capacity that I came to know Ashok because he was my counterpart when I handled counterterrorism at the State Department. And I have to say that this has been an event I've been looking forward to for some months now because it was during our work together that uh, he showed himself to be not only one of the most capable uh, diplomats I knew, but also one of the most thoughtful. Uh, during that period, we worked together to set up something, a new multilateral organization called the Global Counterterrorism Forum, or the GCTF. And uh, that was established out of the belief that uh, the United States and others could achieve a great deal through multilateral means in terms of capacity building, countering violent extremism, propagating norms, and achieving a lot of different uh, objectives that could not be done bilaterally for reasons of political sensitivity. And out of it was also created out of the belief that we needed to have a place uh, where countries that uh, often didn't have a, a good way to talk to each other across all kinds of cultural divides could exchange best practices, strategic insights, and the like. Well, I think it's safe to say that no one is ever going to make a movie thriller about the diplomacy behind international organizations. But uh, Ashok showed himself to be incredibly helpful and adept in this effort. And that was essential because we were dealing with relationships between India and Pakistan, Russia and China, Algeria and Morocco, just to name a few. And in those circumstances, every bit of deafness and insight was welcome. During this period, he showed himself to be not just incredibly gifted, but also a great friend. 
This morning, uh, Ambassador Mukherjee got the full Dickey Center treatment, uh, meeting with faculty and postdocs at 9, Tuck students at 10.30, and lunching with great issue scholars and other undergraduates at noon. And um, for me, it was wonderful to see him in action again uh, and to be reminded what a true scholar diplomat he is. And I should add that somehow along the way, he managed to write five books. Um, you've raised some children, too, haven't you? No? OK. Uh, he seems to have perfect recall. And for the various audiences, he surveyed the millennia of Chinese-Indian relations, the intricacies of Security Council reform, climate change negotiations, and many other subjects. So it's with great anticipation that I look forward to his remarks on India's transformation. Please welcome Ambassador Ashok Mukherjee. Well, uh, after that kind of introduction, I think uh, uh, I should be very careful of uh, what exactly I'm going to say. But when, uh, when I was asked uh, by uh, Dan uh, to come up here and uh, speak to all of you, uh, he wanted me very much to focus on uh, what is new in India. And, uh, and he said that as a person who had earlier been active in the speech writing department, as, I, as he referred to it, we have to have a topic with some lift. So I tried my best to think of something that would be a topic which uh, would have some lift and not uh, uh, get us bogged down in the intricacies of, of, uh, of multilateral organizations and, uh, and the United Nations. And uh, the topic that uh, we've come up with for today is transforming India development and, uh, uh, and diplomacy. Uh, this uh, conjunction of development and diplomacy grew out of a, a heads of uh, missions, uh, an ambassadors conference of Indian ambassadors uh, convened in the first week of February this year by our new prime minister who spent a large amount of his time in explaining to us how things had changed. And that change, of course, goes back to May last year when uh, the general elections were held and uh, a new government uh, took office in India, headed by Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Uh, in the short period that uh, this government has been in power, uh, the objective of this government has been to transform India. And uh, at the core of this project of transforming India is the eradication of poverty. Uh, it's a statistic which is not very often spoken of, but which is a reality which every Indian and especially an elected uh, representative of India uh, faces. And that statistic is that uh, out of our population of 1.2 billion uh, citizens, 680 million live below $1.25 a day, which means that they are below what the World Bank calls the poverty line. And if 680 million Indians are living below the poverty line, then obviously the focus of anybody who's dealing with uh, the destinies of India would have to be to, to, to lift them above the poverty line and, uh, and by doing so, eradicate poverty. So there is uh, a tremendous focus on, on, on eradication of poverty. And uh, I, for this evening's presentation, thought of looking at three initiatives that uh, have been uh, put forward by this government uh, with this objective in mind. These are uh, translated. Uh, the first one, of course, is very well known from the election campaign itself and was adopted by Secretary of State John Kerry when he went to India the, for, for his first visit. In the campaign, it was called Sabka Saath, Sabka Vikas. But very helpfully, we have translated it uh, into inclusive and accelerated development. Now. This uh, I will come to uh, in, in the next slide, but uh, this is the core. This is uh, uh, the, the, the program, the policy objective, which will lift uh, people uh, together and not leave uh, the rich becoming richer and the poor becoming poorer, which is one of the issues on which the election was fought last year. Uh, the second, and that is uh, again something that is uh, linked with eradication of poverty, 
because of its uh, potential for employment generation, and that is the Make in India initiative. Now, this again, I'll come to uh, in the next slide, but uh, this is a major initiative, which uh, the aim of which is to make India into a manufacturing uh, country, a manufacturing economy. Today, manufacturing occupies less than 20% of India's overall economic activity, and that has to change if we have to employ those hundreds of millions of people who are coming into the, uh, into the market. Uh, and the third, and that's uh, perhaps uh, as important an initiative because it looks essentially to what we are today and to the future, and that is the Clean India Initiative, or in Hindi, it was called the Swachh Bharat Abhiyan. Uh, Clean India Initiative, of course, on the surface uh, has been shown on the television screens as the Prime Minister taking a broom and uh, sweeping the front of a police station in Delhi. But it does not only mean that, and I'll come to that as well. So these are the three that I'd like to focus on when talking of transforming India. And then I'd go in the second half of my presentation to how the, uh, the Indian diplomacy is uh, being structured and, uh, and, and, and uh, tasked to meet these three uh, these objectives. Now, Sabka uh, Saat Sabka Vikas, or inclusive development, has basically five core areas to it. Uh, if we have to look at, uh, at, uh, at sustaining uh, and, uh, uh, growth, overall growth, uh, energy, uh, there is a huge deficit in uh, uh, the access to energy. Uh, in India, and without uh, energy, uh, you cannot expect people to even live their basic lives. As the, as one of the uh, mm, uh, one of the uh, mm, objectives goes, uh, 400 million people do not even have a light bulb in their homes. And uh, as part of these development schemes, the objective is to provide at least one light bulb in every one of these 400 million homes uh, within a time span of uh, uh, by 2019, October 2019. Education. Uh, of course, uh, India's uh, educational profile is very well known, especially here in the United States, where more than 100,000 students from India come every year to join schools here. But the fact remains that in the country, education is a sector which needs uh, a, a tremendous amount of uh, attention. Uh, the government by itself has realized that it cannot uh, resource uh, all the requirements, and therefore there's been a huge change in bringing about public-private partnership models to, uh, to encourage the growth of education. Uh, but, and that links directly with empowerment. And here, one dimension of our population of that 680 million, but even beyond the 680 million, which is a special target, uh, is uh, women. Because uh, if we can educate young girls and then uh, they go to school and university and, 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 and come into the, into the, into the mm, workplace, then they get empowered. And uh, there are issues uh, relating to education of girl children in India. There is a, a specific program which has been announced called Save the Girl Child, Teach the Girl Child. Uh, this addresses the issue of uh, girl, uh, girls as children not being encouraged to go to school, uh, ask, being asked to help out at home, and then getting married very early and, and not becoming part of a productive environment. Uh, in, 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 in the overall economic uh, uh, scenario. So empowerment uh, with a special focus on gender, on women's empowerment is extremely important. And so too is empowerment important in terms of the uh, ability of people, especially poor people, to leverage new forms of, uh, of, of, of doing uh, of economic activity. A uh, large number of people do not in India, poor people especially, have bank accounts. Now, one of the schemes that has uh, already been implemented is to open uh, bank accounts so that the poorest of the poor can get the uh, direct cash transfers into their bank accounts, which would take away the subsidies and the complicated um, bureaucratic systems of, uh, of affirmative action, which India has had for so many years. 
Here, the attempt is to empower the poor by giving them the, the tool, and the tool is a financial tool of a bank account. 40 million accounts were opened in the space of two and a half months. I mean, that's quite a major sort of uh, development in, in India, which uh, has uh, come out of the last election. Uh, water and, and especially drinking water. Uh, this is extremely important because uh, there is a lack of access to water, drinking water. There is also a lack of access to water for irrigation and agricultural needs. And this is a priority for uh, the government as well as, uh, again, the model is again to use public-private partnerships to provide clean drinking water and to provide water for, for economic activity. And the fifth uh, part of this uh, policy, of this initiative is, is security. Now, in, in terms of India, uh, there is a tremendous downside on our developmental activities because of uh, insecure conditions. Now, insecure conditions can be of different kinds. Uh, the most well-known uh, for political scientists in India is the insecurity caused by what we call the Maoist or the, the, the left, left of center uh, 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 forces uh, in uh, rural India who have uh, over 11 of our 29 states uh, push, put their footprint on the ground, preventing normal economic uh, activity from taking place in villages and small towns and even in the larger uh, cities, which are the capitals of these states. So uh, this is something that is uh, important. Equally important is security in the regional context, where the threat of terror, which is a threat which uh, India has been living with constantly since the 1980s, um, seems to be uh, morphing into newer and newer kinds of, uh, of challenges. Uh, right now, uh, for example, uh, something that we face in common with many other countries is the growth of transnational terrorism, in which terrorism is not driven by one single issue. Uh, terrorism is driven by a, 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 an objective to create, for example, a transnational space uh, for political purposes, or like the ISIS have announced. So these are the, the, the external aspects of security. There is an internal aspect of security as well, which is the security of individuals in, 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 in our uh, towns, cities, and villages. And uh, linked to this are uh, uh, modernization of our systems to ensure security, most especially the system of policing. Now, uh, like many other countries, we use uh, policing drawn from our communities because the experience has been that a policeman who belongs to the local community is best placed to uh, identify and then also resolve issues relating to security. But over the years, there is a perception that the police uh, have, uh, the standards of policing had, have fallen. And therefore, there is a, 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 a new thrust to, to modernizing and making policing in India more effective. So this is uh, in, in terms of uh, inclusive development. Uh, the transformation of India into a global manufacturing hub is essentially meant to generate employment, to, to provide jobs for literally hundreds of millions of people who are facing uh, challenges of, uh, of, a, uh, of different kinds. The most important challenge that they are facing right now is the change in the demographic in the in the in the way in which the indian population is actually uh, employed in economic activity we are seeing a massive shift from rural uh, uh, populations to urban populations and it is uh, projected that by 2050 67 to 70 percent of india's population will live in its cities in urban environments and this is something that, uh, therefore, where do these people uh, uh, get their jobs from and how, how do they get employed? So uh, transforming India into a manufacturing hub, using the urban centers that exist, as well as the new smart cities, as we call them, that are being conceptualized, is, uh, is one way in which uh, we seek to transform uh, the way we are as an economy today and to provide uh, a way for eradicating poverty and lifting people from poverty into a middle class. Now, this morning, uh, while talking to some of you from Tuck, 
I did mention uh, the other aspect of this new uh, middle class, and that is that it provides also a new canvas, if you can call it that, for new kinds of uh, markets to be uh, created. Because uh, uh, it is not often in human history that you have hundreds of millions of people uh, being lifted up from the poverty line and then uh, having aspirations and demands of their own. And uh, they all do not have to follow a path which has been set out uh, earlier. And especially because the way manufacturing works itself is changing. So there will be a new uh, pressure on manufacturing to make sure that manufacturing does not lead to climate uh, degradation or does not create pressures on the environment. So there's a new market that is there on the horizon and that will also transform the way that India is looked at uh, by the outside world. Now in the initiative, which is called the Make in India, India initiative, there are 25 sectors. And for those of you who are interested, I can leave a pen drive behind uh, for you to look at each of these sectors uh, in your own time. But each one of these sectors has got two main uh, focuses in terms of how we are talking about it with our, uh, within our country as well as with our partners abroad. One is on uh, encouraging the flow of investments because it is quite clear that with the kind of infrastructures we have, we will not be able to transform India into a manufacturing hub unless we get uh, higher and higher levels of investments. And along with investments comes technology. Now, it's not only the technology of today and of yesterday, but also the technology of tomorrow. And that, uh, in a sense, links directly with the issues of, uh, of climate change. And in, cli in terms of climate change, the third uh, initiative is, uh, is, is, I think, quite interesting and important. Now, uh, it's called the Clean India Initiative, and uh, the spectacles are, for those of you who follow Indian politics and history, are the, uh, are the iconic uh, spectacles of Mahatma Gandhi. And that's the kind of logo. Uh, and in a sense, that sets a target date. And the target date is uh, 2nd of October 2019, which is the 150th uh, birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. Now, that is a very Indian way of setting a target in a very emotional and yet a political way. But the target is 300 million people in all the 4,041 towns and cities of India that exist today. And uh, there are some core areas uh, of this policy. The first is sanitation. Uh, for example, uh, I mentioned this in the morning, uh, India today as a country contributes uh, perhaps the largest percentage to the problem of open defecation because there are not enough toilets uh, built in households. Uh, the objective of this program by 2019 is to have 10 million toilets in private households and 500,000 public toilets built uh, all across India. Uh, now, it's obviously a, a target and an objective which sounds good in terms of, uh, of public uh, debate and discussion. But there's also, in tandem, a system of monitoring how many have been built to date because the 2nd October 2019 deadline is a serious deadline. So uh, those of you who are interested in finding out what's happened to these toilets can log on to the website of the Ministry of Urban Development and they will very helpfully explain to you how many thousand toilets have been built and where they are and how many more are due to be built. Now, you know, it's something that we earlier never spoke of. We all knew it existed, we never spoke of it. What is transformed in India today is that you speak openly about these issues. And it's, in a sense, this one initiative will result in a tremendous impact on, positive impact on public health, on, on individual health, and cut down expenditure, which today goes into the medical sector. I mean, this is something that has been openly spoken about uh, by the Prime Minister, by the others uh, economists who are involved with this uh, initiative. And this is how they have uh, 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 put it in perspective. The second, which I mentioned, and there was a World Economic Forum survey uh, released last month, uh, which projects that, uh, now this is till 2032, so the next 17 years, 18 years, India will require $640 billion only to create infrastructure in these 500 smart cities. Uh, 
where, as I said earlier, 70% of India's population is expected to live. So it's a huge requirement. And again, it's coming in uh, uh, through a public-private funding model, through investment flows, and also through technical support from countries which have uh, uh, experience and uh, expertise in building smart cities. But of course, most of these smart cities will have an Indian uh, character. It will not be a smart city from Japan, but uh, an Indian smart city. And uh, I think something that uh, was uh, that uh, that is uh, part of the overall clean india initiative which i think is worth emphasizing and and highlighting today is this notion that it is everyone's uh, problem it's not that uh, old paradigm in which the government would do something and the people would do or not do something uh, the approach is uh, like mahatma gandhi's approach of involving everybody into uh, an issue. The approach is that of a mass movement. So, uh, for example, for sanitation, uh, every individual is, expecting, is expected to put in himself or herself 100 hours of voluntary work per year. And each of those individuals is also to reach out to 200 others to contribute the same. So, you know, this perennial question in India of who will do this, how will it be done, it's so huge. And that issue is being sought to be addressed by getting the participation of India's own huge population itself. And I think that that's something that, uh, in a sense, uh, transcends politics because it goes into the way we are as a country and how we got our independence and, and how we have been able to, uh, to develop ourselves. Now, uh, in this setting of how we are to transform ourselves, uh, a lot of what we have to do internally is, is known. But uh, uh, it is also very clear that you need a very supportive external environment. And that's where Indian diplomacy itself is being transformed. Because it's no longer uh, the diplomacy of uh, the previous uh, 70 years in which you did something, but it was not part of a very, very well uh, uh, argued or a very coherent national development scheme. Uh, earlier, for example, you had oscillations between extreme state planning, then you had a mixed model, then you had a free market model. It, it oscillated as the governments came and went. Uh, now, the attempt is to put it in a less political perspective and more economic perspective or socioeconomic perspective. And with that in mind, the bilateral initiatives in our neighborhood, as well as the bilateral initiatives of reaching out to major powers, is now driven by this socioeconomic uh, uh, driver. And uh, a similar uh, driver uh, applies to our engagement in multilateral institutions, whether it is the United Nations post-2015 development agenda or uh, the, the existing structures in the United Nations dealing with peace and security, without which we cannot get into development. And, uh, and I'll come to each one of them now. Uh, in the bilateral diplomatic initiatives, the first uh, initiative that was taken by, by this government in May itself was for the first time to invite all the heads of the eight states around India to the swearing-in. This had never happened before. And it is to the credit of those states as well that they identified their own stake in this, uh, this experiment that we were undertaking, that they all participated at the head of state and government level at the, on the 26th of May when the uh, government was sworn in. Now, some of them have changed uh, because of elections, but uh, the presence of these states uh, has therefore been a major uh, plus factor. Uh, this was followed up by uh, making the neighborhood the first area where the uh, prime minister undertook his foreign tours. Uh, Nepal, uh, Bhutan, uh, Sri Lanka, and, and, and so therefore there's a focus uh, on the neighborhood and uh, that, in a sense, has already shown an impact uh, as we now talk about the Indian response to the Nepal earthquake. Now, earlier earthquakes have happened in Nepal and in many of the Himalayan uh, regions. Um, but the, the speed at which 
the response came and the scale on which the response came uh, owes a lot to the direct uh, involvement of this new government with Nepal. Uh, there, there was, uh, in a sense, it's almost uh, ironical that the Prime Minister of Nepal coming was attending a multilateral conference in Indonesia. And it was only when his plane stopped at Bangkok uh, for a halt that he got to know of the earthquake from a call from Prime Minister Modi to him. And, and that kind of uh, closeness of communication and uh, familiarity with each other is something that uh, we seek to apply to each of our neighbors. And there are some neighbors I'll come to in the q and I'm quite sure, but that I'll leave for, for, for that. Uh, the objective in uh, the neighborhood uh, priority is to create a supportive external environment uh, which will enable us to go ahead with what we want to do inside our country. In the process, if neighboring countries want to participate in what we are doing, then that gives them an opportunity to, uh, to, to use our development as a booster for their own development uh, objectives and aspirations. And that is something that is now quite clearly understood by all our neighbors. Uh, some of them will choose the pace at which they'll engage, but I think the, the, the realization that it, India's growth and India's uh, stability has a tremendous value for their own growth and for their own uh, prosperity is something that is understood uh, by them. The, beyond the neighbors, there's, uh, uh, that there is a focused interaction on the major powers. And if you look at uh, the, 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 the powers with which uh, India has interacted uh, since the new government came to power, uh, you have the United States, uh, Secretary Kerry led the way, and then you had the first uh, summit between President Obama and Prime Minister Modi in September last year, followed very, very rapidly by the second summit in January this year in India of uh, President Obama with Prime Minister Modi. So the United States has uh, been identified as uh, the, the first partner of India in, in this uh, bigger picture. Uh, that and very interestingly for some people with whom I have had a conversation in the morning, is mirrored by China. Uh, China was the first country to send its foreign minister as a special envoy to prepare for the first visit by the Chinese president to India, which happened in September last year. And now Prime Minister Modi goes to China on the 14th of May, uh, the first, his first visit as prime minister to China. Now, this is interesting because while the United States, people understand what uh, the strategic vision is which keeps India and the United States together. But how does China fit into what uh, Indian diplomacy uh, is objectives are? And I think uh, if you look at what I mentioned earlier of manufacturing, of technology, of investments, you see how China fits in. It, it, these are areas which are identified and publicly articulated uh, they were done during uh, President Xi Jinping's visit to India last year, and they are already being announced as the framework for Prime Minister Modi's visit to China uh, next week. Uh, and then you have Germany and Japan. Uh, uh, Germany and Japan. Now, Germany and Japan are uh, extremely uh, crucial as catalysts for India's transformation. Japan, because Despite all its economic problems and difficulties, Japan has been one country which has stood together with India economically over the last two and a half, three decades. The Japanese, in fact, have, um, at the government level, uh, invested 25% of the uh, money required for creating nine smart cities along a corridor which stretches from New Delhi to Mumbai. It's called the uh, Delhi-Mumbai Industrial Corridor, the DMIC. Now, 25% of that uh, project is underwritten by the government of Japan. And I think that if uh, you put your money where your intentions are, then you are taken very, very seriously. Uh, the Japanese, of course, have their own experience of using technology for development. And this is something that India wants to uh, partner Japan with. With Germany, it is uh, slightly different. There is, of course, a lot of uh, investment technology which uh, will come with the India-German uh, partnership. 
But I think uh, most important for us is the German experience and the German ability to transfer their own experience in skills development to India. Now, uh, we talked about uh, the fact that you know, India's got a large amount of educated uh, people, uh, the, there are a large number of graduates, but the, the reality in the country is that a lot of the graduates who are produced by India's institutions are unable to find proper work. They do not have the kind of uh, technical awareness or knowledge or ability to work uh, in the market as it is, nor do they have the ability to leverage the market uh, as we have it today to create their own businesses and grow them as small and medium enterprises. And in both these areas of technical skills as well as development of small and medium enterprises, Germany is uh, the partner which India looks forward to. And uh, last month in April, uh, when Prime Minister Modi went to Germany, uh, he went basically to the city of Hanover, where India was the partner country for the Hanover Trade Fair, which, as most of you know, is the largest industrial fair that Germany holds. And this year, uh, India was the partner country. So uh, these are, uh, are important uh, major powers with which uh, India is engaged with. Uh, I must mention in, in this outreach with major powers, uh, uh, countries like France, uh, Australia, Canada. Now, these are all G7 countries. Uh, they have their own unique uh, capabilities. And uh, the involvement of India with the G20, uh, which happened when uh, the G20 summit was held in, in Australia in November last year, uh, has today uh, sought uh, this engagement of India with the G20 seeks to leverage the G20 into becoming partners of India's transformation. And uh, the role of, uh, of countries like Australia, Canada, and France uh, should be seen in, in that context. Of course, um, there is, a, there is a, a phrase which I put at the end of this slide, which is uh, act east and link west. Now, uh, those of you who followed India's transformation since 1991-92, when India started opening up its economy uh, to the outer world, uh, will remember that uh, basically that, that process was driven by India's relationship with Singapore. And Singapore was under Lee Kuan Yew at that point of time. And it was Lee Kuan Yew's vision that India should become Singapore's strate strategic depth. And that is what he wanted to do in order to, to counter the pressures that were caused within ASEAN for Singapore by its two larger uh, neighbors. Now, that started off as a dialogue, uh, sectoral dialogue. There was in, small individual sectors, tourism, for example, which was identified for bringing India's policies uh, closer to, to ASEAN. But it soon blossomed into a full dialogue partnership, which meant that there were no economic areas uh, which were left out. And the addition of the services sectors to, to this partnership uh, in Bangkok a couple of years ago has uh, enabled us now to see India, the Indian economy, as almost uh, an integral part of the ASEAN economic space. And in the next three years, the, the completion of two major infrastructure, uh, what we have, uh, what, there's an English word which we started using a lot called connectivity. So this connectivity uh, projects, a very popular word in Indian bureaucracy and media. Uh, the connectivity projects, uh, one linking India by rail to Vietnam and the other linking India by road to Thailand. And these two projects are coming on stream in 2017 and 2019. And these two projects will become the nervous system for the India-ASEAN uh, economic uh, integration. Uh, so that is the reality. And a lot of people coming to India, helping us to transform our country, are aware of that reality and are looking at India in terms of Southeast Asia and probably East Asia. To the West, unfortunately, we do not have a similar optimism uh, because the region to our immediate uh, neighborhood is a very volatile region. It's becoming increasingly more and more fragmented. Uh, some parts of it are breaking up. And therefore, we have to make a jump uh, beyond our immediate neighborhood to 
the neighborhood which lies in Europe and, and, and North America. And that's why the choice of the word link. So it can't be an integrated uh, perspective. It will have to be a perspective which will link India to the West to, in order to help, help us to get partners in the West for our transformation uh, projects. Now, uh, I mentioned uh, earlier when we were doing the Clean India Initiative, uh, the impact of uh, the, or the success of that initiative would depend on a supportive uh, global environment. Uh, one of the processes that we are engaged in right now is the negotiation of a post-2015 development agenda. Uh, those of you who follow development uh, issues uh, know that in 2000, uh, the world uh, was, was given uh, eight goals. They were called the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, and there was a frame, time frame of 15 years uh, within which countries uh, were to try to achieve these goals. Some of the goals have been met, some were not achieved, but uh, the 15 year time frame finished, is finishing in 2015. So uh, three years ago, a process started to update and upgrade that attempt the focus of which is again uh, the eradication of poverty, but this time at, on a global uh, stage. And uh, the, the, the agenda which is being negotiated now has got at its core uh, not eight, but 17 goals. And these goals are known uh, as sustainable development goals. And those of you who are interested can log on to the net and find these SDGs very quickly. So I won't waste your time with listing each one of them. But broadly, they include the eight millennium development goals that were identified earlier, which are basically socioeconomic in nature. They add on purely economic goals like infrastructure financing and, and uh, uh, inclusive growth, uh, things that we've talked about. And they also add uh, goals which are linked with the environment, with climate issues. So. Uh, there are 17 of those goals, and it, when the agenda is adopted on the 25th of September this year in New York, uh, this will become the new international framework for development. And that makes it directly relevant to what we are doing in India. And by a happy coincidence, a lot of it actually uh, aligns itself, because earlier we didn't have targets uh, and, and years on which, uh, by which we would achieve things. But now we have, as I mentioned earlier, already got targets for some of the initiatives that you've introduced. And those targets are well within the 2030 uh, target, which is the outer target of the post-2015 development agenda. Now, one of the uh, experiences that we have in, in, uh, in achieving our own, uh, in meeting the targets of the Millennium Development Goals was how do you raise resources? How do you uh, find the right uh, tools to, to achieve these goals? And we uh, very early realized that, you, uh, that if you have to do it uh, in a sustainable manner, you should do it nationally on your own and not wait for uh, you know, aid to come in from outside or, or technology to flow in from outside. So a lot of the uh, areas, I think at last count, almost 11 out of those 17 areas of the Sustainable Development Goals have already got national uh, means of implementation embedded into them. And that, uh, in a sense, is uh, positive news, not only for India, but also for the success of the multilateral project of the 2015 development agenda. Because if India achieves its targets uh, on time and before time, then the global goals would have been met because the bulk of the, 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 bulk of the people for whom these goals are being crafted do live in, in India. And that's where the numbers come in again. Uh, I did want to mention uh, especially the, the role that we have because of conversations that we have all the time on climate change of renewable energy as part of India's contribution to climate change. For a long time, India was perceived as a country which was always negotiating in a negative way that no, this is not for us, no, that is not for us, and no, we want more time for this. But there is another tradition of Indian diplomacy in economic uh, active, in environmental activities, which many people tend to lose sight of. And that is that uh, long before climate change issues became so, uh, so prominent and, and so real, uh, in 1972, the United Nations itself had convened the first meeting 
of the United Nations on Environmental Protection. And that was a meeting held in Stockholm in 1972. And among all the countries which participated, and not many countries participated, it was an issue which was not fashionable at that time. India was the only country which participated, and that too with its own prime minister who was at that time Indira Gandhi. So there is a tradition of India's involvement in environmental diplomacy, which goes back at least to 1972. What is now new is the approach that this government has brought. Uh, one is uh, the focus and the contribution that India can make to cutting down uh, the use of fossil fuels and impacting thereby on, on the environment by going in for renewable energy. In renewable energy, uh, solar energy and wind energy are the two uh, sectors which have been identified as priority sectors for investments and development. The targets are rather ambitious. Uh, the target for solar energy, if you take the global solar, solar energy output today at 100 gigawatts, uh, India's national target to be achieved by 2022 is 130 gigawatts. So that's a hugely ambitious target. Now, how do you achieve that target is something that, uh, that we need to uh, work on very uh, seriously and very hard. And it was in that context that uh, the former mayor of New York uh, came to India in the middle of February to attend this Delhi Sustainable Development uh, Summit of 2015 uh, and, uh, and announced uh, at the conference that he would be one of our partners in bringing uh, solar energy into the Indian market. So we have uh, tried innovatively to tap into people who have got their own track records uh, to become our partners. And, uh, and solar energy, therefore, perhaps that figure of 130 gigawatts is not really uh, so incredible as it may sound today. Uh, in terms of, of, uh, of, of climate change, uh, there is also the other uh, issue which is linked with uh, the, uh, the, the technologies uh, that you need, environmentally friendly technologies. Now, this is again something that uh, we have gone through in the past. Uh, there have been some very bitter diplomatic uh, engagements, uh, notably between India and the United States, on, uh, on the transfer of environmentally friendly technologies. Uh, the most well-known anecdotal case involves an Indian company which uh, was uh, manufacturing refrigerators at a time when only three Indian companies were manufacturing refrigerators. And they wanted access to the new technology and were told by an American uh, holder of the technology that why don't you let us buy you out instead of your manufacturing with this new technology. It's much better that you sell yourself to us. Now that happened in the early 90s, so um, that's long behind us. Today we are in a different sta uh, uh, stage, and today there is uh, uh, what is called very often a win-win situation, which is seen by companies on both sides. And that's, uh, of course, part of the process of globalization that has taken place, that you have uh, mergers and acquisitions, and in the process of mergers and acquisitions, you have the creation of global brands, and with the creation of global brands, you have uh, technologies which flow along with investments and so on and so forth. So I don't have to go much into that, but I just wanted to flag that uh, uh, the transfer of environmentally friendly technologies is very, very crucial for anyone who looks at transforming India and transforming the world, because uh, these two get linked, uh, if nothing else, because of the number of people involved in India, 1.2 billion people, if they get access to this technology, it does make a tremendous difference. Now, that is uh, probably where I should uh, move into uh, the first pillar of the United Nations, the reason why the United Nations was created to, to, to maintain international peace and security, so that the Bretton Woods institutions could sustain the peace. And that's a quote from the Bretton Woods institutions. Uh, I mean, when people introduce why the Bretton Woods institutions of the IMF, World Bank, and the World Trade Organization were created, conceptualized. They were conceptualized to provide the vehicles for development, for reconstruction. It happened in, in Europe in, uh, in the 1950s. So you can't do that without, in, uh, without a stable uh, uh, and peaceful environment. And uh, international peace and security, therefore, is, is I would say, uh, crucial when we look at the implementation of uh, the Transform India initiative as well as Transform the World initiative of the post-2015 development agenda. Now, what do we see here? This is where uh, black clouds are visible everywhere. Uh, there is uh, a failure of, uh, of, uh, of 
the United Nations Security Council, which is supposed to look after international peace and security, uh, especially in the last few years. And you know, I just have to give you the name of the country and you recognize it from the CNN that you see, Libya, Mali, Central African Republic, Democratic Republic of Congo, South Sudan, Syria, Ukraine, you name Yemen, I mean, you name it. And, and in each one of these cases, you ask the question, what has the Security Council done? And in each of those cases, I would not be surprised if you come up with the answer that it has not done much. It, in many of these cases, has taken uh, recourse to what I call the, the, the band-aid of, uh, of diplomacy, which is call for peacekeepers, have peacekeepers flood this country, and, 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 and everything will become normal again. It doesn't work. It doesn't work that way because peacekeeping is not, not a tool which was conceptualized to, 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 to maintain international peace and security in the way that we need it today. It was meant, supposed, it, it is a tool to maintain peace and security between two countries which have signed a peace agreement. For example, Israel, Syria, Golan Heights, 1974. Uh, there, there's peace and security. Cyprus, uh, 1974 again. But, you know, there's a uh, comparatively, compared to the countries I named just now, more peaceful. But when you ask peacekeepers to get involved within the country, within Mali, within the Central African Republic, within South Sudan. Uh, and there are no peacekeepers as yet in Syria and Ukraine, but I assume that they would, again, if the Security Council had its way, be asked to get involved in, within those countries. Then the chances of uh, peacekeeping actually providing uh, a, a sustainable solution to the, to the problem of peace and security is very remote. And therefore, we have strongly felt that there is a need to review the way the Security Council uses the one tool that it has right now of troops on the ground through the peacekeeper, peacekeepers to deal with, with this issue. There is uh, another part of uh, the United Nations Security Council, which I'll come to in the next slide on peace and security, which causes at least my country a lot of uh, concern, which is the way they use their, 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 their the resolutions and, and the tools that they've got under those resolutions to address another threat to peace and security, which is terrorism. But I'll come to that in the next slide. In, uh, in, in, in this one, and I'd just like to uh, finish this uh, part of, of the discussion with a reference to uh, what we believe uh, actually the Security Council should be doing. And if we were permanently sitting on it, what we would be nudging the Council to do. And that is to actually do the heavy lifting of diplomacy, of a peaceful settlement of disputes through political dialogue. Now, this is something that takes a lot more time. But the end result of that, and it's the case of East Timor. Many of you remember East Timor. As East Timor shows, that has got a sustainable impact that, that sustains the peace. Now, terrorism. This for the United States, for India, is perhaps the single biggest existential threat that uh, peace, uh, that people in, interested in peace and security uh, can conceptualize. And I know with Dan and I, we have had many talks on, on this subject. But today, I wanted to focus on the impact of terrorism on development. And that's something that not many people uh, sort of talk of very quickly. You talk of terrorism and religion, terrorism and root causes of uh, uh, terrorism, poverty in the refugee camps of the dispossessed and all that. But I think 9-11 changed some of the root causes approach that those 19 who flew those planes were not poor. They were quite rich uh, people. Uh, and Mumbai 2008 changed it as far as India was concerned. It was the first time we had a terrorist attack on a financial infrastructure, Mumbai. Uh, which sought to actually set back India's economic growth. Now, this is 2008, just before the when the financial crisis was going to overtake the world. And if that had succeeded in what it meant to do, then India's contribution to the, uh, the international effort to, to recover from the global financial uh, crisis would not have happened. There would have been no payout of $40 billion to that fund, which was made by India in 2010. So, uh, that changed it. And it also took away the focus from what we had earlier seen as single issue driven terrorism uh, to a much bigger impact of terrorism on economic growth and development. 
Mumbai 2008 had nothing to do with, for example, Kashmir, nothing. It, it, but the actors were the same. So therefore, there is, uh, in our uh, reading of the situation, uh, an impact of uh, terrorism, uh, which is incubated in our region, on development. And this uh, impacts on us and the amount of resources we have to divert from our normal economic and social activities to countering terrorism. Those of you who've traveled through Indian airports know very well what I'm talking about. But it also impacts on countries in our neighborhood, those to whom we've reached out, uh, because they have a spillover impact of terrorism, either terrorists using their countries to come and attack India or, uh, or jointly attacking two or three countries. And it also impacts countries like China, because uh, if, if you use terror as a policy to to undermine economic growth and development, and you see the targets that have been chosen in Xinjiang, these are not targets linked with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with single issue terrorism like religion or, or, things like, or poverty. These are targets like uh, the, the special economic zone in, in Urumqi, which is a very, very strong economic target for those who follow China. Uh, you can see the, the significance of Urumqi as a hub for all the transport trade uh, links which connect China to Europe. So, you know, these are issues which I think are important. But I would like to come to the second half of this slide, which is what has the multilateral response been to this uh, most uh, uh, visible threat to international peace and security? And I would, uh, although I put the Global Counterterrorism Forum first, I think that actually comes uh, after. And I, I therefore would like to start with the United Nations as it is, the General Assembly. Now, the General Assembly is, uh, is like parliaments all over the world. They, they debate a lot, but uh, then what they come up with at the end of the day sometimes is what in the United States is called a pork pie bill. I mean, you have all kinds of uh, formulations, compromise uh, uh, phrases added on. And the end result of all that, when you deal with legislation to counter terrorism, is that it is not uh, adequate. I think our experience in the United Nations uh, General Assembly for what is known as the Global Counterterrorism Strategy, the GCTS, is that it is a very nice, uh, nicely uh, sort of packaged strategy. But the main purpose of the strategy is to do capacity building. There's nothing else that this strategy is meant to achieve. And although it's got four pillars and you'll find reams and reams of paper and thousands of experts talking to you about the global strategy on, on the ground, that apart from capacity building, it has no relevance whatsoever. The General Assembly is even more complicated because it refuses to define what terrorism is. And there's this very long-standing Indian initiative on, 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 on encouraging the United Nations as a result of a debate in the UN General Assembly to adopt a comprehensive convention against international terrorism. That entire project, uh, which started in 1996, is stuck till today because uh, there are countries in the United Nations, believe it or not, who do not know how to define terrorism. So uh, without a definition of terrorism, the comprehensive convention can't come into being. Uh, so that's the General Assembly. That leaves us with the Security Council. Now, the Security Council, to its credit, responded very quickly after 9-11, passed this very famous uh, resolution, uh, 1373, which uh, happened soon after the 9-11 attacks in, in, in the United States. And then I, I mean, Dan, you would correct me, but I think then lost its way. Uh, it, uh, it has uh, adopted several resolutions addressing issues like uh, preventing terror, uh, nuclear material from falling into terrorist hands and uh, capacity building, which is like motherhood and apple pie. You can't dispute capacity building, uh, which is what the Security Council does through a thing called the CTED. It's, uh, it's an executive directorate of the Security Council, and they go all over the world encouraging countries to build up their capacities. But what does it actually do in terms of prosecuting and penalizing terrorism is yet to be seen with some exceptions, which of course are there, like the ones who are uh, incarcerated in, in some prisons here and there. But uh, by and large, for a country like ours, for example, like for India, we have no uh, relief, to put it in legal terms, from the UN Security Council resolutions, although they do exist on paper. And part of the problem with the UN Security Council resolutions is that 
the implementation of these resolutions is done by a committee. For example, uh, if the threat is from Al-Qaeda, then you have an Al-Qaeda committee 12, under resolution 1267. So 1267 committee. Who are the members? The members are the 15 members of the Security Council. Ten of them keep changing every two years, but five of them remain permanent. And what is the eventual outcome of discussions within this committee on issues of terrorism? It is, a, the result is a compromise between these five that they will not uh, act in a way to harm each other's interests, but if it is the interest of any other country outside these five, then that's uh, not of concern to them. And when people ask me, for example, about what we are doing in using the United Nations Security Council to get after people, to get after people who, who did Mumbai, the answer is very simple, that they have done nothing. They don't even want to um, ensure that you know, these people are tried and convicted. So, so therefore, the Security Council uh, itself is, I think, has, has lost its way. There's another dimension which I don't, uh, I don't want to question the, the, the sincerity of it, but there is uh, an element which has crept into the way the Security Council deals with uh, sanctions lists, and that is uh, essentially driven by many European countries to bring in a human rights dimension to uh, dealing with terrorists, and through that pressure, uh, an institution was created, not through discussions among the 192 countries, but within the Security Council, as a compromise between these five, uh, of an ombudsman. So this ombudsman uh, is the person who applies a human rights standard to the Al-Qaeda sanctions list. And in the last few years, uh, we are outside the council, so we do not know what the rationale is for why they reach these uh, decisions. But many people who were put on the terrorist list by member states using credible evidence, because otherwise they wouldn't get onto that list, have been happily taken off because of some other process of reconciliation with some of these people. And this applies especially to, uh, to, the, uh, to the terrorists who have been put into that list from Afghanistan. So there is a, a, a mixture, and I think uh, for anyone who looks at it as a pure rule of law based into, uh, uh, sort of uh, process, the mixture of politics with rule of law is not a happy mixture because you end up with many compromises uh, in the process. And, and, and that is some, one more reason why the council seems to have lost its way. And that brings us to the Global Counterterrorism Forum, which uh, uh, the United States initiated and which we were very happy to be part of right from the beginning. I think the Global Counterterrorism Forum has done something which the United Nations has not been able to do, which is to, to set norms, especially in using rule of law. They have two broad streams, and I'm sure you've heard about the Global Counterterrorism Forum separately whenever Dan has spoken to you all. But uh, for us, the, the, the part of the GCTF which deals with, ru with the rule of law, with establishing norms, uh, that has been the important part and which has given us a lot of satisfaction, which has enabled us to put our own domestic stakeholders into the negotiations. So we've had our own uh, experts, lawyers, uh, police people, security people participating in the GCTF and working together with the other members. We had 30 when I left, but I think there are some more now. Uh, countries and, and, and agreeing to, uh, to these norms. And now the intention is to try and see if these norms can somehow be put into the multilateral context of the United Nations. It is an uphill task because this has been done by 30 countries. There are still uh, uh, 160 countries outside the tent. So while most of them are happy to go along with what is suggested, but there are some countries which are not. And without consensus, you can't reach anywhere. And therefore, uh, what do we do? And uh, for the last 23 years, we've been saying we should reform the Security Council. And this issue has uh, gone on for some time. But in 2005, <coughs> all the heads of government and, uh, who, who participated in the 60th anniversary summit of the United Nations agreed unanimously that the early reforms should be done uh, of the UN Security Council. Now we are approaching the 70th anniversary, 10 years. And uh, whenever we ask, you know, where is the progress? Uh, it is with a lot of shame that a lot of us have to say that there is no progress on this unanimous decision because there's not a sheet of paper on the table 
which would show where countries stand with, with in relationship to reforming the Security Council. Now, there are probably three big issues in Security Council reform. Uh, one is uh, how many uh, permanent members should there be and how many non-permanent members. And here, the group of four uh, countries, which is uh, Germany, Japan, Brazil, and India, in 2005, announced that they were willing to take on the responsibilities of permanent membership, which means more contributions to the United Nations, if they became permanent members, which left Africa uh, as, a, as a continent uh, still to announce its, 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 it, the, which country from Africa would want to shoulder the same responsibility. The African uh, group as such, 54 countries in Africa, have been unable to come up with one uh, clear name of an African country which uh, would be the African permanent representative in an expanded security council. But uh, here, academically, the issue is that it is surely not for a group to propose a country, it's for the country to propose itself. I mean, you know, so therefore, uh, whether the group position is used to, to, to block any African country from coming up by making all of them uh, subject to a group unity, and the group unity itself is open to question, is an issue which, uh, which uh, continues to, to puzzle people who are looking at Africa. But the fact that most of the crises that I spoke of earlier are happening in Africa makes it more imperative than ever before for Africa to have its own voice inside the council. There are ways in Africa of dealing with political crisis. Unfortunately, there are no permanent members from Africa sitting in that council chamber. So the council continues to uh, try and resolve these political crises using uh, what is relevant in their context, in Europe, in, in North America, and perhaps in, uh, in Eurasia, in, in Russia and China but nothing to do with Africa. And therefore, I think the, the world is losing an opportunity to get uh, uh, relevant uh, input and insight into how uh, the UN Security Council can become more effective in, in addressing it. Uh, and as far as uh, the, the second issue is that of the veto. Uh, this is a very, very uh, uh, emotive issue, especially after what's happened in the last four years, when people have seen the extent of human suffering that has been caused not only in Syria and Ukraine and now Yemen, but also in Africa. And there are literally hundreds and thousands of internally displaced persons. It's not a small figure of a few tens or twenties. Uh, South Sudan, 800,000 displaced persons. Nobody even speaks of South Sudan. Many people don't know where it is. So, you know, that's the kind of human suffering that exists on the face of this planet. Mm -hmm. And if we are to lift those people into the ambitious post-2015 development agenda, we cannot do it without a uh, uh, supportive uh, uh, peace and security environment. So that is something that is important. So when we come <coughs> to the veto, Right now, there is a very well-known initiative taken by France, one of the permanent members, to limit the uh, use of the veto for any mass atrocity crime. Now, when you ask the French that, have you proposed this amendment inside the council? What do the other permanent members say about it? The answer you get in a very French way is no. It has not been proposed about it. So then the next is to ask whether any amendment to the UN Charter has been proposed to bring this uh, issue into the UN Charter so it becomes uh, applicable? And the answer again is no. Then you ask, is there going to be a General Assembly resolution to express the moral views of humanity on the necessity for such a limitation on the use of the veto? And the answer again is no, there's not going to be a General Assembly resolution. So therefore, the point I'm trying to make is that even an issue which is of great importance, after all, India was the first country to propose the UN Genocide Convention in 1946 because our soldiers saw the horrors of the Second World War, and we had read Richard Lemkin. So, I mean, it's something that affects us directly. We went through Bangladesh in 1971. We saw what happened. But when you want to use genocide uh, and use it politically to say, no, limit the veto, you find that here the permanent members are not even able to agree to that. And therefore, what is the value of the veto in the hands of these permanent members? So therefore, uh, it wouldn't surprise you to know that at least India has said that if we become a permanent member, we will not use the veto at all for 15 years. 
and probably we would like to abolish the veto in the course of those 15 years sitting inside as a permanent member. That is the objective. The veto is the most non-democratic mechanism in the UN Security Council, in the UN itself. And the third is the numbers, uh, which are the countries which will come. Now, there are constituencies of different kinds. Earlier, the world used to be spread between five regional groups. And you know, you had the Asia Pacific, Africa, the Western European group, the, uh, the Latin American group, and the, and the Eastern and Central European group. Now, there are more. And uh, especially uh, one uh, group which is very, very prominent and very vulnerable is the small island developing states. Now, they are facing a crisis of their own kinds caused by climate change. I mean, you've seen what happened in Vanuatu, Tuvalu, uh, in, it happens in Maldives. And they feel that there is no one to look at this issue from the perspective of maintaining international peace and security. Because their feeling is that if these nat nat natural catastrophes happen, then there'll be mass migration of people. Migration itself causes uh, big issues for peace and security, as we see in Italy these days with the migrants coming out of Africa. So what happens to these 32 uh, countries in the United Nations who are small island developing states? This is a very important uh, issue. And therefore, I think most people would want that group to have one of the non-permanent voices in the chamber so that by rotation every two years, one of those 32 would be sitting inside the council. Similarly, for uh, landlocked or least developed landlocked countries, countries like Nepal. Now, uh, who will address, uh, you know, the intention is to move away from the paradigm of 1945, when five countries knew best what was for the world. Today, we are in a more democratic system. So why not have the voices of that uh, group, that, that kind of country inside the chamber? So there are these three issues related to UN Security Council reform. But I'd like to conclude the slide by a quotation from Prime Minister Modi, who said, that institutions that reflect the imperatives of the 20th century won't be effective in the 21st. And he has uh, made uh, very, very uh, emotional uh, references to Security Council reform just last month in a public address in Paris uh, and in a joint press conference with Chancellor Merkel in Germany, which uh, I can share with you. And that brings me to the final uh, part. And I'm sorry if I've been speaking for too long, but the final part is uh, what uh, does India feel it can do to transform India at home and to transform the world in which India lives? And here uh, I would uh, focus on, on these five uh, principles or five concepts. Uh, one is the concept of nonviolence, which we've applied at home to get our independence, uh, with which the name of Mahatma Gandhi is associated and because of which in the United Nations, uh, we initiated the International Day of Nonviolence on 2nd October every year, since 2007. So since 2007, India takes the lead in organizing the Day of Nonviolence. And what we have been doing in, uh, in the UN headquarters itself is uh, broadening the, the event that we organized to bring in more and more young people, especially high school children, university students, into this building so that they can inculcate into themselves the concepts of nonviolence, which are shown through films from that period, through speakers who participated, uh, like Mahatma Gandhi or Martin Luther King or Nelson Mandela, you know, so that this, this entire approach of resolving conflict through peaceful, nonviolent means is, is set as a core moral uh, value. That's one thing. The second, of course, is democracy. Now, Mr. Modi mentioned it when he came to the United Nations last year, that there is a surge of democracy in the world. And of course, uh, the question is, how does the world, uh, how has it coped with the surge of democracy? But the fact remains that between the United States and India, we are the two largest contributors financially to the UN Democracy Fund. And this fund every year uh, implements 800 projects all over the world using non-governmental organizations to spread democratic values and, and practices and principles. And it is an ongoing viable uh, project. And therefore, uh, because we are ourselves rooted in democracy, like the United States, we believe that democracy is a core value of the United Nations system. And it's only through democracy that we can transform India and that we can transform the world in which we live in. Uh, the, the third is non-discrimination. 
you know, I briefly mentioned it uh, in the morning uh, that uh, among the first initiatives we took again in 1946 was to uh, ask the international community to address the issue of, uh, of uh, racial discrimination in South Africa. Uh, this was something that was, uh, that was very much part of our consciousness, uh, if for nothing else, because Mahatma Gandhi himself had spent so many years fighting, for, fighting against racial discrimination in, in South Africa. As things turned out, uh, from 1946 to 1993, it, it, it is a fairly long period of time. But with the emergence of a new South Africa, with the emergence of Nelson Mandela at the head of a new South Africa, I think that enterprise showed that with perseverance, focus, and attention, and the weight of big powers behind it, it can succeed. And I think that that uh, is uh, something that we would like to carry forward as, uh, again, we enter into a period of transformation and change. Because transformation and change will be breeding grounds for discrimination. It, it, it has happened too often in human history. The, the fourth value which I spoke of is gender equality. And I think I mentioned that already, uh, the contribution that, uh, that we have made in our own country uh, to gender equality uh, right from the beginning, from our freedom struggle where men and women were hand in hand uh, fighting for political freedom, uh, but more uh, importantly in organizations like the International Labor Organization, which we joined in 1922, the issue of women's rights was something that India was propagating long before women's rights, uh, again to use a phrase, became fashionable. So uh, it, 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 it's something in which we have been deeply invested in the formulation in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of all human beings are born equal is a formulation which owes itself entirely to an Indian woman uh, uh, activist from India who, uh, as I said in the morning, engaged with Eleanor Roosevelt and convinced her that do not use all men are born equal, but use all human beings are born equal. And that was the kind of contribution that we have made and that we want to keep on making with now the new entity in the United Nations of UN Women. India is the strongest financial and program supporter of, Indian, of UN Women in the United Nations system, which, which, which uh, creates its own momentum. And finally, the, 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 the perspective which uh, the Prime Minister spoke of when he came to the United Nations and which he speaks of all the time in India, of transformation. The transformation takes place on the basis of, uh, of, a, of, a, of an outlook on how do you look at uh, yourself and the world around you. And there are two Sanskrit words that are used, uh, which I'll translate. But the Sanskrit words are Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam. Now, Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam translates as the world is one family. And if you approach the issues of transformation, of, uh, of, of development, and of threats and challenges to transformation and development, through this perspective, then I think uh, this is a contribution that we are uh, that we have uh, that we have made and are willing to to continue making to make the world we live in a better place. And just to illustrate this, uh, somebody asked me uh, the other day about how uh, we have uh, been dealing with this in our own uh, region and in our continent. And I said that look at the response that. We had after the Asian tsunami in 2004, where India was one of the major first responders, the response to the nuclear reactor accident in Fukushima in Japan, where again India was one of the first major responders with 46 people from India going straight into, the, into that reactor in the first week itself. Uh, and more recently, the evacuation of people from Yemen, where again India not only evacuated uh, thousands of its own citizens, but thousands of citizens from other countries, including United States, United Kingdom, France, and Russia, uh, and most recently Nepal. Again, uh, this is uh, what I would like to refer to as the white knight syndrome. For those of you who read Lewis Carroll and Alice in Wonderland, that is what uh, we would like to do. And that is inherent, in, 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 integral to the concept of Vasudhaiva Kutambakam. Thank you. Well, so I didn't make this the sign because every bit of it was great and it was all fascinating. But I think we have time for two quick questions. So why don't we open it up and uh, see if we have any. You may have explained it all already. I don't know. Uh huh. Yes, sir. What Can you wait for that? Just wait for the mic. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, what do you see as the role of the Indian diaspora in uh, supporting and helping to achieve the goals that uh, you set out? It's a very big role. Uh, the success of the Indian diaspora in countries like the United States is uh, very evident. But there's a very strong Indian diaspora in almost every country that they've gone to. Altogether, we estimate there are almost 28 million Indians living abroad out of our country. Uh, and the contribution they can make to the transformation that we are now undergoing is quite immense. Uh, the diaspora which lives in countries like the United States, Canada, Europe, uh, Australia, they have a higher profile, higher worth contribution to make because they are able to help us to leverage uh, finances, technology, best practices, and, 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 and catalyze the, the transfer of that uh, to India and also help the countries they live in benefit from that. But there is an equally important uh, but not very well-known role of the diaspora, uh, the poorer diaspora, which uh, is mainly to be found in the Gulf states, uh, where 6 million Indians, Indian passport holders, uh, live and work in the oil economies of the Gulf states. And uh, they remit every year almost $50 billion directly to their homes in India. So that's a huge uh, contribution they make because just imagine if in the process of raising resources for transformation, you were to lose this 50 billion, uh, which is coming in directly into your economy and not going into any investment funds, then it, it has a huge uh, negative impact, the, the loss of that. So the diaspora therefore is important and so too is the relationship. And I didn't speak much about the Gulf, but uh, that relationship for India is, is extremely crucial because it, it's, it's linked with remittances, it's linked with livelihoods, and it's linked with a very old uh, uh, linkage between India and those countries uh, of which we can talk of later. You listed five uh, goals, education, energy, empowerment, water, security. I thought an important one was missing, and it's one that India has always had an ambiguous um, relationship with, and that is globalization. I mean, it's probably fair to say that the, it's com countries that have embraced globalization that have transformed themselves from poverty to wealth, mm -hmm. and today it's global corporations that do it, and yet we've always had an ambiguous relationship. Mm -hmm. How and when is India going to go from an attitude of suspicions towards global corporations to welcoming them so that that transformation happens? Well, I think that uh, I didn't mention it because that was not uh, the, 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 those five principles which Mr. Modi had listed himself. But uh, to answer your question, uh, it, it, it is true that when India opened its economy in the 1990s, uh, it looked uh, with uh, caution at uh, global corporations and multinational uh, uh, corporations. But uh, the, the, the spread of uh, the opening up of the Indian economy uh, brought about a change in that uh, perspective, perception on the ground in India. And today, uh, I can do no better than to give you examples. Uh, for example, Microsoft, which is perhaps the, one of the better known global brands, you'd agree, uh, is, uh, has got its uh, production facilities in Hyderabad and in Bangalore. And they're very welcome, and they have even got an Indian as the head of Microsoft, uh, uh, Sam Nadella. So it, uh, in a sense, acknowledges that we are part of a globalized world. Uh, if you drink Pepsi Cola, then you have an Indian heading Pepsi Cola, and she's always welcome to India, uh, Indra Nui. Uh, if you have a credit card, MasterCard, and you want to use it in a globalized world, you have Ajay Banga of India, heading, was junior to me by three years in college, and I know him quite well. So, you know, there is an acceptance and, uh, and a welcome to these global uh, leaders in India. Uh, but I think it's uh, as important to understand that... Uh, the global uh, players who come to India, come to India, of course, for their own uh, reasons, primarily profits. And, and that's what they should be doing, because that's the reason they exist. But having come to India, what happens to some of them, and I gave the example earlier this morning of Vodafone. They came to India to do the same thing. 
But when they came to India after a year, they started changing the way they do their business and they develop business models in India which they applied to other countries in the world. So uh, the interface between India and global corporations is actually of benefit not only to the uh, profits of the global corporations, but also to the way in which they conduct their own uh, activities. And I think that that's something that, uh, that is useful. Of course, the examples I've given you mainly are in the services sector, not so much in manufacturing. Uh, now that we are sort of anticipating the entrance of global brands into India and manufacturing, uh, I would perhaps need to come back again after a few years, <laughs> after I've retired, and Dan invites me to talk to you about that. Yeah. And you will certainly be welcome to do so. Uh, it's been wonderful, uh, an incredible tour of the horizon. And I really want to thank uh, Ambassador Mukherjee and thank you all for joining us here today. Thank you.